Eastern Europe is a complicated place that outsiders often find difficult to grasp. But even by the standards of Eastern Europe, Belarus is a bit of a riddle. Its history, its people, and above all, its name. Unsurprisingly, many people make mistakes when they talk about it. To help you find your way in this barrage of information and misinformation, and as an extra benefit to make you look good when you talk to a Belarusian, let's try to unwind the origin of the Belarus's name. Well, as much as the modern science knows it, and in the process touch on few questions of the origin of Belarus itself. Now, the word Belarus includes two parts, Bela and Rus, which is widely known to mean White Rus. This is exactly the form that we use in the English language, and that directly derives from the original word for Belarus in its own language, which is the most straightforward way of doing it. Good job, English language. Well done. You too, Polish, Ukrainian, Romanian, and Bulgarian. Good job, Eastern Europeans. Stick together. At the same time, in a whole bunch of other languages, Belarus is translated or transliterated as White Russia. That includes French, German, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, Swedish, Danish, and Lower Germanish. Well, I'm kidding, Dutch, but you know, after Wit Russland, I think I'm allowed. Does this difference make sense? And does it really matter at all? It has to be acknowledged that those languages have been exposed to centuries of conflicting and shifting names between Rus, Kievan Rus, Old Russia, New Russia, Ruthenia, Rossia, new spellings of the old name, and so on. Well, let's try to fix it a little bit. First of all, let us take a look at how the future Belarusian lands were called in history. For these, let us take the first ever map that specifically focused on those lands. This is the map of 1613, published by William Blau in Amsterdam. On this old map we can find the region of Palesia. We can find the Slusk Duchy. We can find the Rogachev territory. We can find the Rechitsa land. We can even find the Mogilov district. But there is one thing that is clearly missing. Where is White Rus? It is nowhere found. Not even mentioned. And why all of those lands are called Lithuania? Well, maybe that was a bad map, and we should take a look at some others. Here is a map of 1690 by Gerald Falk and Petro Schenk. Again, it shows us Lithuania. Interestingly, in the corner where we have Lithuania today, it says Samogitia, right here. Let's compare it with a modern map. Where we had Lithuania, today we have Belarus. Where we have Lithuania today, it shows Samogitia. The map of 1696 by Carol Allard, same story. Where we had Lithuanian Grand Duchy, we have Belarus. Where we had Samogitia, we have Lithuania. The map of 1710 by Van Kulen. Again, where it said Duchy of Lithuania, we have Belarus. Where it said Samogitia, we have Lithuania. The map of 1711. Where we had the Duchy of Lithuania, we have Belarus today. Where it said Samogitia, we have Lithuania. I think you start getting the point, but let's keep going. 1742 by I. Coley. Where we had Lithuania, we have Belarus. Where we had Samogitia, we have Lithuania. 1759 by Tobi Lothar. Where we had Lithuania, we have Belarus. Where we had Samogitia, we have Lithuania. Ah, you would say, I think I understood. Belarus was Lithuania, and Lithuania was Samogitia, and White Rus didn't exist? Well, I wish it was that simple. The truth is that the term White Rus came to those lands relatively recently, only in the 17th century with the earliest mentioning in the 16th century, which by European standards is quite recent. However, the term itself existed before that. To understand how it happened, we have to start deeper. Like a millennium deeper. Until the 5th century, the region of modern Belarus was largely populated by Baltic tribes, which historically preceded Slavs. Various cultures associated with Balts spread from the Baltic Sea deep into modern Russia in the east. And if you look at the coverage of Baltic hydronyms, like names of rivers and lakes, Baltic outreach covered Belarusian lands entirely, reaching into modern Ukraine in the south and deep into Poland in the west. It becomes an increasingly accepted viewpoint that the original Slavs appeared somewhere along the Belarus-Ukrainian border around the 5th century, influenced by the migration of peoples during the Hunnic invasion of Europe. The exact place of the Slavic origin remains a debated issue, but the volume of recent archaeological discoveries continues to point to this area. It is theorized that the Proto-Slavic language evolved from a common Baltic Slavic background as a lingua franca in the areas of contacts with Iranian, Germanic, and Celtic cultures. What followed next was a massive expansion of Slavs during the next five centuries. 
It is important to point out that this area was not exclusively populated by Slavs, but was heavily mixed with other people. In many cases, we talk not about a pure migration, but about a cultural expansion, where tribes of different origin gradually transitioned into using a Slavic lingua franca that spread through cities as trade centers. After all, the term Slavs literally means people of a word, or people who understand each other. The same explains a notoriously peaceful nature of the Slavic expansion into the Baltic lands of modern Belarus. Until now, there are lots of debates about how much it was due to a migration and how much it was just Baltic tribes gradually assuming a Slavic tongue and associated cultural influence. The main tribes that created a Slavic component of the future Belarusian mix were Kriviches, Drigoviches and Radimiches. Among them, Kriviches and Radimiches are sometimes suggested to have had a Baltic origin. On the Baltic side of the future Belarusian mix were Lithuanians and Yotvingians. In reality, Baltic and Slavic components were heavily mixed across the entire territory, although at different times, in different proportions. Same as elsewhere in Eastern Europe, Slavonization was happening through cities. First in the lands of Kriviches, through the largest city of Polotsk, but also Vidipsk, Orsha, Izaslav. Simultaneously in the south, in the lands of Drigoviches, through Turov, Pinsk, Brest. And eventually in the west, through Volkovysk, Grodna, Slonim, Novogorodok. The last city, Novogorodok, became the first center of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania that eventually united all of those lands, as well as with the semi-autonomous Baltic land of the Samogitians. Now that we've figured out the background of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, let's explore the Rus component of it, and then look at what was so white about it. Naturally, the Rus part is connected with the ancient Kievan Rus, and for this reason we need to quickly review it. As we have discussed, this was the area populated by early Slavs by the 5th century. And this was the area where Slavs expanded to after the 5th century, with Kiev, whose early archaeological data points to the end of the 5th beginning of the 6th century, positioned as the linchpin of those territories. Unsurprisingly, those were exactly the lands that 5 centuries later created the core of what we today call Kievan Rus. More specifically, the principalities of Kiev, Chernigov and Pereyaslav. By that time, Slavic tribes were already well distributed across Eastern Europe. Traditionally, the beginning of Kievan Rus is associated with the moment when a ruling dynasty from Novgorod captured the Kievan throne in 882. But by that time, a Slavic confederacy of these lands already existed in various forms, for example, as a part of the Antis Confederacy. The coming of the Rurikids of Novgorod helped to connect the lands from Kiev to Novgorod. Eventually, Kievan Rus stretched to such key principalities as Smolensk, Novgorod, Rostov, Halic, Volyn, and Rezan. The Principality of Polotsk is also included into the cultural sphere of Kievan Rus, but it was a notoriously separatist duchy. After it was captured and pillaged by the future Kievan Duke Vladimir around the year of 980, it stayed peaceful for about 85 years and then, in 1065, resumed its wars against Kievan lands. Despite staying politically independent from Kyiv for most of its existence, the Polish Duchy fell into what can be described as the cultural area of Kievan Rus, also called as Ruthenia. This was the state of Rus before the major apocalyptic event happened in its history, the Mongol invasion of the 13th century. It was exactly the Mongol invasion from the east, combined with a new, powerful enemy from the west, the expansion of the Germanic Teutonic Order, that created conditions for consolidation of a new capable country, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. It came out of the Slavic and Baltic synthesis, including parts of the northwestern Ruthenia, primarily the Polish Duchy. And when one of the prominent Lithuanian rulers, Olgerd, married one of the last princesses from the Polotsk dynasty, Mary of Vidipsk, the lands of future Belarus finally came together. But that wasn't the end of it. The Mongol invasion created the Golden Horde, which subjugated all of the remaining Ruthenian lands. You might have heard the theory that Belarus became known as White Rus because it was never conquered by the Mongols. But this is just a nice legend which appeared much later. A century after the Mongol invasion, the Grand Duchy became the main consolidator of Ruthenian lands and in 1362 the same Grand Duke Olgerd inflicted the major defeat upon the Mongols in the Battle of Blue Waters, liberated Kiev and added the former heart of the Kievan Rus to the Grand Duchy, making it the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, Ruthenia and Samogitia. By the way, in modern times, Olgird's name is sometimes changed into Algirdas as a part of nationalistic tug of war. 
But for the purpose of this video, we're using the closest to the one he used himself on his official seal. As you can see, it was even written in Kyrillic. Okay, we figured out Lithuania and the coming of Belarusian lands, and we figured out how it was all connected to Rus. Now let's finally uncover White Rus. We will start with this famous map by the Swedish cartographer Olaus Magnus, published in 1539. Of course, ancient maps were far from accurate, but we should definitely pay attention to the order and direction of things, especially since this is the map of the Baltic coastline which was well familiar to the Scandinavians. Here we can actually find White Rus. Interestingly, it is located to the north of Rus and even further to the north of Lithuania, in other words, of modern Belarusian lands. If we compare it to our modern map, it points to here, which was the land of Novgorod. The next map is an iconic map by Fra Mauro. Created a century earlier than the previous map, it was the greatest achievement of the medieval cartography and it took many years to create based on eyewitness accounts from travelers. First of all, let's pay attention that the map is upside down. Here is how an outline of Europe fits on it. North will be at the bottom, south will be on top, east and west on the opposite sides. Let's zoom into our region. Europe will be there, Asia will be there. Next, we find Lithuania. Interestingly, it is to the east from the province of Maxaver, which, according to historian Leo Bagro, is a province of Minsk. Even more interestingly, it is to the east of the Dnieper River, which would place Lithuania to here. Well, not too surprising, knowing what we have discussed about the origin of Lithuania earlier. The next thing we find is Red Rus, which is another historical name for Ukraine. Again, together with Lithuania, this positioning makes sense. Then we find such a curious thing as Black Rus, which was a fluid concept on European maps. And then we finally get to White Rus, over there, in Asia, behind Moscow and in direction of Arctic shores. Look, the same region again, the lands of what became by then the Novgorod Republic. Today, historians believe that this region was the first to start consistently associating with White Rus. It is theorized that the name came either from the White Sea or the White Lake in this area. Such historians as Ales Belli suggest that it likely originated from the local Finnic tribe of Vepsians, who in Germanic texts are referred to as Visi. This name is related to the old German word Vis, meaning white. But in any case, this White Rus appeared in the context of a larger Kievan Rus, in its northern part, and eventually solidified as a reference to the Novgorod Republic, which was a prominent player in the Baltic region. Novgorod was well known across Europe, especially through its trading role within the Hanseatic League. Now let's try to follow how this name started to move. In the 15th century, a fast-expanding Grand Duchy of Moscow started its encroachments on the lucrative Novgorodian lands. This eventually resulted in the Battle of Shalon in 1471, which led to the absorption of Novgorod into the Moscow Duchy. After that moment, we start seeing increasing references to Moscow itself as White Rus. Here is a map of Eastern Europe by Bernard Wapowski of 1520. Moscow is mentioned as White Rus. Here is a map of Moscow itself of 1610. It calls the city a metropolis of White Rus. Here is a Dutch map of a much later period of 1749. Muscovia is called here as White Rus. Before its destruction by the Mongols, Kievan Rus made a massive impact on the evolution of East Slavic principalities. It existed for over three and a half centuries, and the competition for its legacy never really stopped until nowadays, a whole millennium later. But in the period that we are discussing, two East Slavic principalities grew as the main contenders to inherit the Ruthenian legacy, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and the Grand Duchy of Muscovy. This civilizational battle was about to get really bloody really fast, with the fortunes switching back and forth between the two sides. We fast forward to the 16th century to a major conflict between our two contenders, the Livonian War that lasted whooping 25 years. Although the territory that Moscow troops managed to capture was fairly small, it included the key metropolis of Polotsk. Polotsk stayed under the Moscow's control for 16 years. Eventually, the Allied forces of Lithuania and Poland took it back, but beginning from that time, we started seeing the first references to Polotsk as White Rus. Remember the map by Carol Allard that we saw at the beginning of the video? Here is Samagidia, here is the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, 
but in the corner a new reference appears, White Rus. At that time it referred only to a tiny part of modern Belarusian lands. But as the contested area increased, so did the use of the term White Rus. Fast forward another hundred years. The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth is in the existential conflict against Russia, Sweden and internal rebel Ukrainian Cossacks. This 13 years war became known as the Deluge, and this name says it all. The Grand Duchy of Lithuania lost half of its population in it. Here is the Grand Duchy, and here are the measures of modern Belarus in it. From the beginning of the war, Moscow troops had a very successful and very ruthless advance. Entire territories of Belarus and Ukraine came under the Moscow's control. Key Ruthenian cities that got occupied by Moscow included Mogilov, Mstislav, Orsha, Vitebsk, Polotsk. At the same time, almost the entire western part of the Commonwealth fell under the Swedish troops. Only a sliver of land in the south remained under the control of Poland and Lithuania. But after the eventual signing of a peace treaty with Sweden, following the death of a Swedish king, Poland and Lithuania regained control of its western part and restarted its offensive against the Russians. After its victories near Polonka and Chudno, as well as the citizens' rebellion in Mogilov and the Cossack victory over the Russian troops near Konotop after breaking an alliance with them, Poland and Lithuania managed to push Russian troops almost from its entire territory. As you can see, that war pretty much defined the eastern border of modern Belarus. Now cartographers used the term White Rus toward an even bigger part of former Ruthenian lands. Again, a map by Tobia Lothar that we saw at the beginning of the video. Samogitia, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, but now you can also notice a subdivision within the Grand Duchy. The left part says Lithuania, those western Belarusian lands from which the Grand Duchy started. And the right part says White Rus. And if we zoom out, we will also see Red Rus in Ukraine. Here and here. And as you can see, the lands of Red Rus start in Poland, Lithuania and then stretch into Muscovy, which implies that this was not a political reference but rather a geographical or an ethnic one. The original lands of Kievan Rus within Poland, Lithuania now associated with White and Red Rus. At the same time, we see the decrease of the use of the term White Rus toward Muscovy. We can summarize that White Rus appeared in the lands of Novgorod in the northern outposts of Kievan Rus. Then it moved to the lands of Moscow following its absorption of Novgorod before it started to associate with contested Ruthenian lands within the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, eventually losing its meaning in other places. But what is important that in all of those cases White Rus was a reference to the legacy of Kievan Rus and not the reference to the modern state of Russia, even though the spelling on old maps would look the same. So the algorithm for the evolution of the Belarus's name looks the following. From the ancient concept of Rus came a historical entity Kievan Rus, whose legacy was eventually divided between the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and the Grand Duchy of Muscovy. This correspondingly evolved into Ruthenian lands in Poland-Lithuania and the Russian state that succeeded Muscovy. These two entities represented eastern and western directions in the evolution of the Ruthenian legacy. The Rus lands of Poland-Lithuania produced Ukraine and Belarus. And within Belarus, the Rus part refers to this Rus, and not to that one. This is why names like Vitrusland or Weisrusland or Bielorussi sound to a Belarusian ear, well, ridiculous and uh, ill-informed. These names are supposed to evolve from the name for Kievan Rus in corresponding languages and not from the name for the Russian Federation. The confusion is multiplied by the fact that, unlike historical White Ruthenians of the 17th century in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, Russia had its own actual White Russians in the 20th century, and mixing those two is like mixing Austrians and Australians or Swedish and Swiss. Those old concepts are different geographically, linguistically, ethnically and religiously. In the end, it is worth remembering a simple rule. Same as Rus does not equal Russia, White Rus does not equal White Russia. Thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, don't forget to press like and subscribe to this channel if you want to see more videos about Eastern Europe.